identity arrives in hierarchical situations where you need to know where you are on the in the pecking order to keep yourself safe. Mm. That's like you're arriving in a new mead hall in a new territory in the dark ages. Like you need to know who's in charge, who's you know out of favor where are you in the pecking order so you can keep yourself safe as a stranger coming into a new community so identity is a way of like trying to map out your environment your social environment so that you can be safe but that doesn't actually reflect complexity or what's actually happening welcome to the holistic life navigation podcast where we explore life through the lens of somatics i'm luis mojica a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Okay, I'm very happy to welcome my friend Sophie Strand to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is so, our first time being digitally involved rather than actually <laughs> being living, breathing organisms together, which is, I think is like the inverse of how this ha mostly happens. Especially since I started my podcast, because all my friends that I've made from being podcast guests first, I only know them digitally. So it's, yeah. it's nice that I know you physically, and now you're a digital, you're a digital representation of that. <laughs> We're having a canine interjection. <laughs> hush That's, now, child. Hush, hush, child, please. <laughs> Mommy's sleeping. Um, so I'm, the first thing I want to do is have you just introduce yourself to my audience. Tell us however you want us to know you. Well, very simply, I'm a writer. I call myself a compost heap because I'm always stirring between the ripe and the rot. And I'm also a combination of the microbes, the thinkers, the poets, the mistakes I've made that I'm, you know, a, a, a melting, changing, shifting patch of soil. Um, I also sometimes call myself a neo troubadour animist in that I believe everything can be made into a love story and love stories that involve more than human elements. So yeah. I would say that I am a writer, a lover, and a compost heap. So I'm a, I'm a fellow compost heap. And what I'm curious about talking with... <laughs> so I'm going to get part of my compost heap. Go ahead, go ahead. Take care of the other compost heap. Yeah, he's become very, very convinced that the heater is animate, which maybe is a lesson for me. Yeah. Maybe he knows something you don't, right? <laughs> So what I'm curious about, what I'm always curious about, and you and I have spoken about this on our walks, is this relationship between identity and body. And I'm I'm constantly obsessed with this because um, so much of my suffering came from identity. And especially the the kind of rewards and trophies and labels I was given from different psychotherapists throughout my life. And I was really attached to them. And I realized the identity was this construct that wasn't allowing the compost heap to do what it wanted, not allowing the body to just unfurl the way it does and be new and die and rebirth and all these things every day. So I'm wanting to discuss this intimate felt experience between like having fun with identity, but the reality that we're always something new. Give, give, just where do you want to start? I could go for 40 minutes. The one thing I will say is I've been thinking of identity as a really good technology or strategy. It's a strategy that's useful, but it's not a um, intrinsic truth or implicate truth. And it's not always useful. But if you think of mycorrhizal fungi, which are those filamentous fungi that create, you know, forest systems that hold the soil together, they'll fruit up and look like superficially look like mushroom individuals above ground. But if you see a fairy ring of mushrooms that all look like a crowd of individuals below ground, they're one being. And so they do that when they want to reproduce, when they want to send out spores to travel somewhere else. So I sometimes think of identity as being a reproductive strategy. It's about creating difference, creating gradients of difference that allow new complexity to come into being culturally, physically, biologically. And so identity can be a very useful strategy, but it's not always the most useful strategy. And right now, it definitely doesn't seem to be well wedded to the entangled and complicated reality of biodiverse ecosystems and also holding complexity culturally. Um, I am really interested in how the idea of the atomized self is relatively modern and highly dependent on the kind of chirographic, which is written oral, I mean, written textual culture we live in. So for most of human history, we've been oral storytellers, which meant that knowledge for us was never an object and it was never belonged to an individual, that it was always held in boats of breath that stitched us into our environment 
and into our relationships. And so the only way you could keep alive your understanding about how to stay alive, how to live in place, how to grow food, how to keep your culture alive was to keep telling stories in community. And, 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 and that showed us that knowledge happens between us, thinking happens between us, and it is stored in our relationships to each other and to place. We can look at the Aboriginal culture in, in Australia with their song lines. We can also look at place names in Ireland. Um, and one of my favorite writers, Mankin Magan, has written a lot about, you know, the kind of ways in which land is a mnemonic device in Gaelic. Um, and how the memories don't exist in a self, they exist in a culture's, a community's relationship with a landscape. Um, you don't remember something until you have that, you know, calculus of body plus land. Mm. That the, the memory isn't stored in the brain or in the self, it's stored in your ancestral relationship with a certain place. And you need to put those things together in order to access your, your inheritance and your knowledge. But when we start writing, we pretend like knowledge is something that's only human and can exist in, within a singular self. That if you told a story in an oral culture, it was always a communal experience. Mm -hmm. But when you can write things down, suddenly you can pretend like you are the only person who owns knowledge. But this is not actually reflective of how anything comes into being. We are all like those mycorrhizal systems. Every time we breathe in, we are metabolically, materially looping with our environments. You know, my favorite philosopher and my friend Andreas Weber says, self is only self through other. other. You know, even in biological terms, our cells are turning over. We are building our bodies with the people, with the plants, with the soil that live around us. And how could we possibly think that an individual could be responsible for their own healing when you, if you take the air out of a room, your idea of individuality melts pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, we are always body plus. Mm hmm. I mean, you're all hearing in real time. Sophie Strand has just uncovered why I'm not writing my book. <laughs> what? This is not not like I'm not going to, but this is why I haven't written it because there's no, this know. like you know what I mean. There's this living like I hear it as like a living fornication that happens even with my breathing. You know, like when I'm when I'm in a group of people, like I their pheromones are entering my lungs. I mean, how much more intimate can you get with somebody? And so when I'm in this communal place of holding space and I'm telling a story or I'm in a Q&A or I'm just kind of like, you know, weaving back and forth like, like we are, it feels so intimate and present and new and it will never happen like that again. And I'm so for, like there for that. I so work that way. To put it onto a page, it, it's like this weird, it's like embalming the body, which I don't want to happen to be. fossilized knowledge. I mean, that's the thing that I think about which is in oral cultures, information is always flexible and up to date. Mm. Because it's, every time you bring it back into being, you have to adapt it to the circumstances, politically, climatologically, to the people you're with. You know, it's incredibly sensitive and empathic. But your knowledge becomes a fossil the minute you put it down on a page and it doesn't have to respond or change. Mm. Yeah, I think, and that's why I'm so... I, I get bored. Like when I sit down, and I start writing, I get so horribly bored. Okay, so we we have to talk about this later because you did successfully write a book that everyone well, loves and, that, and you have another one issue. coming out. That's the issue I'm dealing with now, mm. which is you write a book and then the way publishing works is that it takes about three years for it to go through all the rigmarole of editing and then getting endorsements and getting it printed. And by the time it comes out, you, if you're a person like me, you've already had a hundred different conversations with people like you and changed your mind. So you're being held to this perspective that you only had for a crystallized moment. Um, so I'm happy that this fossil exists and that it's a crystal of a certain moment, but it's like an insect in amber. It's not the mm. living, juicing, leaking, composting being I am now. <laughs> I love and that, so this is a great metaphor for, and there's two parts here, three parts, four or five, they're just, you know, fruiting in my brain as we talk about this, that this idea of the, the insect in amber is exactly how I experience identity, because I find my identity gets so stale. Even identities that I love and think are like beautiful and sexy and interesting, they get so stale for me because of what you just said, how the oozing takes a whole new lack of identity piece uh, 
in my body, in that compost, like that inner dance that's happening. And you said one time to me, um, I said to you that identity is the way we, you know, desperately try to organize our reality, which is something Esther Perel says a lot. Yeah. And then you said you think it's from a low capacity for ambiguity, which yeah. I loved. And I thought we could play with low capacity for ambiguity and how identity is the strategy or tool that's born from that. Oh, this is so good. So, you know, this is, I'm going to speak into your terrain, into something that you have a lot more um, understanding from the inside of, which is, you know, trauma as in our body, as something, as a way our body responds to certain events. And I like to think about trauma culturally and how, for me, you know, I'm a survivor of early abuse that was quite violent and gave me severe PTSD. So it's something I've been navigating for a long time and thinking about. And one of the ways that we try and deal with PTSD and trauma is by creating a stable environment that feels safe. And often that impulse, which is understandable, creates a very boring and problematic environment <laughs> for us inside our bodies and our lives. But for me, it's like everything has to be in its place. I have to know where everything is, which of course doesn't leave any space for more interesting ideas or encounters or evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in our culture right now, we've been deracinated, uprooted from our web of kin, from community, from empathy, from, from the kind of relating that gives us flexibility and, and, um, uh, and joy, mm -hmm. um, you know, somatic embodied juicy joy that we're in a trauma state. And so it makes sense that we're, we're in this traumatic place where we're trying to create st stable value dualisms. Everything feels so out of our control that we need some pretend idea of control. And I think the pretend idea of control is identity. It's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic rather than like really engaging with the full messiness of the, of the um, escalating crises in front of us. We're playing this other identity game because it it's a way of pretending like we're safe. Mm. As you're saying this, I'm just hearing identity is a trauma response, right? It's just yeah. this reflexive, like you said, illusion of I have some control here. And there's this temporary soothing. It really soothes us to think, I know that, or I know this person, or I know this part of me. Well, if you think about how identity functions, it often, identity arrives in hierarchical situations where you need to know where you are on the, in the pecking order to keep yourself safe. Mm -hmm. So like you're arriving in a new mead hall in a new territory in the dark ages. Like you need to know who's in charge, who's, you know, out of favor, where are you in the pecking order so you can keep yourself safe as a stranger coming into a new community. So identity is a way of like trying to map out your environment, your social environment so that you can be safe. But that doesn't actually reflect complexity or what's actually happening. You know, as you're saying it, I, I think about my experience being born into an intersex body and how I, you know, like when you say identity as a tool and I hear that great example you just gave, um, it's this incredible tool. I think that the issue for me and other people I've worked with is it starts to become extremely constricting when you actually start believing the identity, right? Yeah. So like when I had to believe certain things about myself because of how I was moving through, it constricted my ability to really transform every minute I breathed. And, and now it's kind of like, I love the, it's all, it's like identity is such a joke to me. Like when I, <laughs> when, like when I hear myself say, I'm a trauma educator, like I laugh inside. And when I hear myself say, or someone refer to me as he or myself refer to me as he, I'm like, oh, the drag of gender, so fun. You know, it's all just such a joke to me that I, I don't even know how to, to believe it anymore. But I think that's, for me, part of the healing, maybe my trauma response, even not believing the identity. Where do you go with that? I just love this idea of identity as always being drag. <laughs> <laughs> always, like we're no matter always what. This, <laughs> like, we're always this like, we, these, these weird, you know, I, I say we're doorway skin silhouettes for matter, you know, that are like mm -hmm. wearing drag sometimes to do certain things. Um, where do I land with this? You know. It was so interesting. There was a moment where I was complexifying my experience of femininity and I was like, I'm not female. I'm definitely non-binary. And then I was like, that's just re-articulating the same issue that I was finding in femininity. <laughs> yeah. 
that it's much more interesting to live the question to say like god what am i today yes that's <laughs> okay today? that's it that's where and it so is rilke my favorite poet says like don't answer the question live it and i think that identities that are stable that you decide on and then you perform are answers to questions that need to be lived like you're you're ending the creative process when you try and definitively answer something i'd rather be a living organismic question um so i don't know what i am today every day i'm like am i a little um, am i a little he today a little she a little they a little creature am i spring raccoon i feel like a spring raccoon today <laughs> you know this takes me back to um when i was how old was i i was 21 yeah and there was this museum called the bodies exhibit um it was oh, i, don't I know remember it, that it terrifies it was, me it was a huge it was a big deal it was highly yeah. controversial and yeah. it, it was happening in the seaport right on the east side um, of new york city and i went there with my family and i remember going through the nervous system exhibit um which i wouldn't realize how much it would affect me until now and there was that i don't know if you remember there was that long I don't know if it was resin or what it was, but it was a perfectly preserved brain, eyes, and nervous system just like cast in this, you know, plastic box. Yeah. And I remember looking at it thinking, whoa, no wonder we're in drag. Like we're terrifying underneath. <laughs> it's like yeah, this interesting crazy. creature that is always with us that I'm looking at you right now with. But all of this, like you said, the skin silhouette makes it something we can understand. I know. How are, so how do you how do you answer these days when you're asked to self identify? I feel like when you're being asked to self identify these days, you're being asked to like take the pin and pin yourself like a butterfly. To, like, <laughs> That's exactly how it feels. Like, it feels like, yeah. I always want to offer, you know, here's a really interesting piece of information. So I'm cutting off the question I just asked you. So I want to note that because we're going to return to it. <laughs> but, there's an incredible theorist who I love who writes about a lot of my ideas about orality and literacy come from him called Walter Ong. He wrote this book called Orality and Literacy. And he documented how when anthropologists go to cultures that are still mostly oral and you ask someone to self-identify, you say you you so they're in you go to like a village in Russia where they mostly don't write mm -hmm. oral. You say, who are you? Like, who are you in this community? They never answer with any I information. Mm. They say, we are beginning to bring in the crops. There are good stories. Sometimes me and my grandfather will tell these stories together. But there's no, it's all about relationship and community and context. They're never able to identify like an atomized self. And I love that. And so when, when people have been asking me, like, who, you, who are you? I keep thinking like, how would I answer that question? I, let's play with this a little bit. And I love the the pinning the butterfly. That's, that's really that's how it feels in my body when I try to do it or when someone tries to do it with me. Um, but I, I, when you brought me that example of the oral tradition and that little that group of people, I love that because um, I've played somatically with this difference between who am I and where am I? And that's been like yeah. huge. And it's what you're talking about. And yeah. someone says, you know, who are you, Luis? Or, you, you know, there's that idea, um, we need to know who we are in this lifetime. Like, who you need to go find yourself. <laughs> and so when I would hear these kind of heroic concepts, I, I, I noticed somatically again, this clenching, this desperate grasping for the who am I? And then having to keep up and maintain the who, right? When instead, when I go to where am I? I'm like, right now, I'm with you right now my belly is i can feel it like digging into my ribs and i can feel my spine against the back of this chair and i'm watching the water cut through the snow on the rocks and this is where i am this has nothing to do with me and it has everything to do with me and so i couldn't pin down a sense of i right now if i tried yeah i've been thinking a lot about the idea of interactivity that the, the feminist physicist Karen Barad came up with, which is there's no such thing as objects. There are interfaces and events. So just as like the shore or the horizon isn't a real thing, it happens when the sand meets the ocean. We are interfaces that come into existence through interaction. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the only reality is interaction mm -hmm. and, and contact, moments of contact and interaction. And I only come into visibility and into being through these interactions. And it can be the interaction between me and you, but it can also be through the sunlight coming through my window, through, you know, the smell of my dog, who's a little stinky being in the next room, through 
you know, the sun, the, the blue sky that is beginning to shift my own internal state that I'm beginning to reflect the blue sky in my own mm-hmm. body. And mm-hmm. so I've been thinking about, you know, we are, we only come into being through interface. See, that's, that's profound for me because I think what I love about animism is I see it as the missing medicine for so much trauma healing work that's out there because of what you just said, you just described the other than human relationships that affect the body and are complete connectors and transformers that are readily available at all times because we're constantly, when you say interface, I hear relate, you know, we're constantly relating to everything around us. And I, and this is where it gets tricky. So there's two parts of this I'm going to drop here. First part is trauma is this inherent feeling of being disconnected from relationship. So this feeling and experience, I can't connect, even though it's always happening, but usually we're oriented toward where we're wanting it and not getting it. So, so much opens through the animistic lens because we're always in relationship. The second part is relationship isn't always pleasant right? Everything is relationship, but it's not always pleasant. When I look into the forest, the forest teaches me that rupture and violence and aggression all are part of fertility and growth. So how do we hold that in this human concept and construct that things should be good or bad? I'm just so curious. I mean, the idea of good and bad is highly contextual. It's it's not it, it has to do with your where you are. <laughs> good and bad is about location. And I think a lot about how becoming new, surviving is never about being safe. Mm. People are very concerned with being safe, but not with surviving. And actually, if we look at how evolution works in deep time, extinction events, trauma is how creative cre- the creativity of evolution works. That we are not the children of Eden some safe garden. We're the children produced by the Chicxulub crater, by an impact event that killed off 95% of life and left open the ecological niches that let proto-mammalians dip in and exper- experiment with different mor- morphologies that then produced us. That if we go even further back, early bacterial cells half cannibalized each other. That's neither pleasant nor safe <laughs> to produce the anarchic bodily fusion, the indigestive. So I think a lot about how emergence, emergence internally and physically is about indigestion and how if you fully digest something, if you fully process something, you've actually, you've, it's, it's like colonialism. You've fully taken over the culture, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but actually the way to really, to really collaborate is to not fully digest something. So we could, these, these proto cells, half digested each other and part of one became the mitochondria in the complex cells that create our bodies today. So on a very material level, we're the product of this anarchic early cannibalism. That how do bodies come into being? Trauma is the calculus of body making. And that if we're experiencing trespass and open openness that means that we're always having to grow around trauma rather than fully digesting it, that means we're being invited into the kind of symbiotic body mergers that might help us survive in the collapse to come. But being on the front line, the somatic front line is not going to be safe or fun. And it may mean burning the bridge to your old body behind you. You know, my favorite example is lichen and algae, lichen, which is a holobiont. Com- like a being composed of many other beings is the word holobiont. So it's algae, yeast, bacteria, and fungi. And they all give up their individuality and they merge to create a new being. What would it feel like to begin to experiment with how that feels? I mean, it might be delicious and painful all at once. So this is so timely for me because I told you this before and I've talked about it a bit on here, but you give me a container to really dive into it more about how trauma is so inherent to vitality, to life. It, it isn't this, yeah. this concept that trauma is the horrible bad thing that happens and like peace is the good thing that happens. Like trauma and peace are related. They're interconnected for me. And so this understanding of what would it be like to give up my individuality 
reality to trauma? You know, what if I wasn't bracing against trauma or bracing against ruptures or bracing against unpleasant people or situations, but there was this merging and I'm not talking about this obvious way of merging, which is, you know, codependent and losing yourself in a situation that would kill you. But in the way of like, I'm actually noticing my ability and agency to have a relationship to the charge that moves through me, this thing that we call trauma as inherent to nature and life, not against nature and life. I mean, I think your, your definition of trauma as being this lightning strike has been so transformative for me that it's this like absolute rupture that is transformative, difficult, beautiful all at once. And can we become the conduits for this charge rather than letting it get stuck? Exactly. Okay, everybody, that's the end of the podcast. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's incredibly, it's incredibly tricky. And I think one of the things I'm struggling with all the time is this oscillation between needing to be needing to take care of myself and knowing that not all of my trauma responses are useful right now, but then sometimes knowing that getting rid of all of them also might not be useful. How can That's I right. not settle in only one idea of what's right? Well, so I get curious about this and I'll, yeah. I'll ask you your own personal experience, but how you, how you might experience this in your body, because what you just said about how some are useful, right? Some are useful, some are not. What I continuously find with my work with myself and others is the the issue is not if the trauma response is gone or awakened. It's how much we think we're responsible for figuring it out. The, mm -hmm. These bodies are so old, right? I mean, how yeah. old are these bodies? Like they know what to do or we wouldn't even have this conversation right now. We wouldn't be here probably. I find there's this very strange, very... Um, very spiritual psychedelic experience in somatics that I, I, I experience where we become the witnesser of the trauma response kind of doing its thing. And, and this, there's this idea of completing, which I love how you talk about completion, not being ideal for you. And I, I agree. I, I really prefer cycling and metabolizing. And when you're talking about the digest, the digestion, metabolizing to me doesn't mean it merges and it's just the same thing. It means that, um, there's this capacity in you to actually be the conduit of whatever that charge is in that moment. If the charge is, I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm laughing, I'm dancing, I'm reflexively grabbing a bag of potato chips. Like that charge has so many ways it propels us. How humbling is it to move aside and watch the body deal with the propellant rather than thinking you oh, have yeah. to deal with the propellant? Like, tell me about that in your own journey of being with this stuff. I love that you brought up psychedelics because I've been thinking lately, I just did this course for people with treatment fatigue who have chronic illness, terminal illness, and trying to recontextualize the creative ways our body um, collaborates with trauma, with um, bodily breakdown, rather than saying it's all bad. Hmm. And we, we talked a lot about my theory of the ways the body shifts around trauma and physical incursions is oftentimes deeply psychedelic. And it's, you know, rather than going and taking a pill, we can begin to honor these things. And it's not going to be fun, you know? You know, it's only fun when you pay $5,000 for a shot. I was going to say, that's why we need the pill usually, because it yeah. forces yeah. you into the thing. You're not ready. Forces you into yeah. it. But, you know, one of my things that I've thought about a lot is, so I have a very serious um, genetic condition that predisposes me to a lot of other bodily breakdown. And something that happens a lot is I have these extraordinarily intense nausea events where I end up vomiting for hours. And yes, these are bad, but I also, they, they're ego death. Mm. They like, you know, they, they put me into this meditative state where I receive some of my most creative unhinged ideas. And I thought to myself, would I give up these things? these events, these terrible events. And I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think that complexity is something we need to start playing with, which is I was, I was thinking about, there's, there's this idea in Candomblé and in um, Voodoo and traditions of divine horsemen, which is we've forgotten how to let ourselves be possessed. That oftentimes trauma or mental illness is a possession experience that we don't know how to correctly inhabit because we don't have the ancestral tradition or the community or the spiritual animistic context that lets us do this. 
And what they call it is being a divine horseman, which is, can you let yourself be ridden? Can you let yourself become the steed for this energy that is well far exceeds our moral idea of good and bad, which is, so can you let your body be, be the conduit for this electrical force? And we've forgotten how to be ridden. And so sometimes when I think of a trauma response, I'm like, how do I let this move me like a horse rather than like a rabid animal? And like, I, I can't say, don't ride me. It's coming here. <laughs> this, this divine horseman is about to take me on and possess me, but I can decide if I, if I work with it or if I totally try and buck it and, and, and shift it off. And for me, so I have like, you know, I have these trauma responses I can't get rid of, but I've begun to try and think of them as being like divine horseman experiences. See, that's just lights me up because the, the charge riding me is the exact experience that I've had. And it's exactly how I see trauma. And I I've been calling it the electric kiss of the goddess recently I because love that. Yeah. it brings this romance piece into it um, because it's so romantic. I mean, what could be more benevolent than some unseen cosmic collective force charging me with electricity to run from an abuser? I mean, what, right. what's more benevolent than something taking away my coherence so I don't have to experience being eaten alive in the woods, like through dissociation? These are incredibly spiritual, psychedelic, somatic experiences that we we are gifted with just from being born. Yeah. We don't have to do any training. We don't have to go to any special events. It's just, it's inherent in our body. This clinical way of separating trauma from nature, the same way we separate ourselves from nature, which is to me, the real root of colonization is this separation from what these things and people you relate to. It's the separation that causes all the pain and suffering rather than the learning how to relate and be that conduit. Yeah, and I oftentimes think about so many of the ways that we need to act to be a conduit to this energy are pathologized, like like shivering and shaking and running and hooting right. and yelling. Like we need to be so much more creaturely. But our idea of normativity is 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 so incredibly narrow. It doesn't give us any latitude for actually letting this energy move through us. Yes. And as you were speaking earlier, I was thinking when you were saying about it wants to ride me, I was thinking yeah. the majority of my PTSD and trauma and the people I've worked with, it wasn't the, the, the lightning bolt that struck us. It was the years of bracing to look normal, right? I, it was, that's, and that's the real trauma. Is you That's know, the, the real trauma. The event comes through. And that's then if right. you're allowed to yowl and run about and develop your divine horseman skills, <laughs> yes. okay. But yes. it's years of trying to like, for me, that was so interesting was I, so I, I dealt with heightened hypersensitivity after my traumatic event, and it made me not able to really interact in normal social situations with incredible ease. Like, I think mm -hmm. I was able to project it, but I didn't feel it inside. And it was only after I repressed these memories, put them in a box, compartmentalized them that I was better. And it immediately shifted into, you know, life-threatening illness. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, the minute I became normal, I started to die, you know? That's right. Well, the, the somatic experience of being normalized as we're talking is really about repressing that electricity. Yeah. And when electricity, which is so vibrant and alive and, and big and powerful, is shoved into my shoulder, I'm going to have, you know, physical illness because it's too much life force just stuck in my little shoulder. And it's it a weather system right there. Yeah. You have <laughs> yes. to a bigger landscape. A much bigger landscape. And yeah. I and I love that this because, you know, my trauma showed itself at a young age with um Tourette syndrome and yeah. ner nervous tics. So I was always doing this with my fingers. And then when I discovered the piano, it's like, oh, it had somewhere to play. And then the piano and the music coming out of it would bring my body back to situations that I got to like honor through song. So there's already this kind of inherent indigenous shamanic tendency that we have from our ancestors that we've lost, like you said, because of colonization and such modernity. And when we're given the body, the ancestors come through and all those techniques come right through intuitively. So it's about, again, for me, it's like, how do, I'm going to ask you specifically, people listening are like, sounds great. How the fuck do I do it? How have you, give us an example of a situation where you felt the charge, the electricity coming and you've let it ride you and it's taking you somewhere really beautiful. Well, here's a, one I was thinking about when I 
so I had a lot of nervous tics too. And just like, like kind of like, you know, just like oral fixation, picking yeah. like, and like panic attack, just shaking. Mm -hmm. I could feel a lot of energy living right in my throat chakra with my hands, like a feeling of wanting to do this. Mm. And I, of course, you know, as soon as I could start smoking, started smoking. And there was oh, yeah. that, energy. there was that, that, <laughs> You know, I, suddenly that energy was moving. Um, and when I knew that I had to quit smoking, I, I thought to myself, I am not getting rid of this energy. This energy is so intense. So if I remove the cigarette and don't actively put it somewhere else, this is going to be really, really bad. <laughs> and so I started to obsessively walk and walk and walk and walk and walk to such a degree that it could be considered some kind of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. I walked myself back into an awareness and an animism and an intimacy with a specific place. Like I walked myself, I walked the energy through me. I That's didn't get rid of the energy. I just tried to actively put it in a different place. And it was so interesting because that kind of nervous attention when I took it away from the cigarettes and I put it into a kind of obsessive compulsive relating to the squirrels, the plants, the trees became, became a kind of encyclopedia of aliveness. So suddenly it was like developing this really intimate, hyper attuned relationship with place. And you know, that kind of focus when it's put onto a cigarette or onto picking your nails can be destructive but when it's put onto other beings, it can be highly attuned. Yeah, I'm just really marinating in that because that's a, a beautiful, a beautiful example. And and even when I think just how you said in the beginning, you know, like childhood traumatic experiences, we we don't have the agency to walk and walk and walk as children. Oh. So it's even your body gets to do with the charge what it wasn't able to do then. And there's this great oh liberation God. in that, right? I'm still, I'm going to be walking my whole life to walk it off, but I love it. I don't have to ever finish this experience. And I think yes. that's yes. something I've thought about a lot recently is, yeah, I just need to move my body a lot after certain things that happen. Like I don't need to talk it through or analyze it. I just need to move physically. That's right. That's right. So I, I oftentimes just try and dance or go on a run or go on a hike and walk and not try and figure anything out. I let my body figure it out just by walking and moving both the spiritual and the psychic lymph. I think a lot about how lymph doesn't move on its own mm -hmm. in our bodies that we have to move to move the lymph. And I think about psychic psychological lymph, like I've got to physically move. I've got to see other beings. I've got to create these different versions of myself with these different interfaces. I have to be in different places and then the lymph will move. I'm just marinating again. I'm marinating loving. together. I love. I, <laughs> We're marinating together. These are my favorite metaphors, like marinating, steeping, fermenting. Mm. When the juices inappropriately, inappropriately, like meld and create something mm. slightly alcoholic, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's it's you know I think the piece I'm really marinating in that as well is this reality that the body will figure it out. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm just on the heels of this cognitive understanding of a felt experience uh, around the body processes everything for us. Like we take too much responsibility in our healing. I really think we do, right? Yeah. And so I'm really kind of going yeah. into this. I don't, I'm actually not responsible for anything that happens in this body. This body does it. And I, I noticed it the, last night in this kind of metaphor that came through me as I was talking, you know, when you eat a citrus fruit and the bioflavonoids like reorganize themselves inside of you and they make collagen and collagen repairs your, your kidneys and your internal gut lining. It's like, I didn't go out that day and said, yo, guess what I did today? I ate an orange and made some collagen and repaired my tissues. Like I would never take responsibility for that. So why are we taking responsibility for this other amazing uh, cosmic transformation of trauma healing? The beautiful part of that too, which I'm just picking up on is that it really comes down to this nucleus of appetite and desire, which is we're just desiring beings. And if we begin to trust our tastes and our desire a little bit more, we'll be led to the things that we need physically and erotically, psychologically, like you wanted an orange, like you wanted this taste, this sensual experience, you would desire for it, but it's doing these sub perceptual things in your body that you need. And it's like, there's a cascade of benefits that comes from the flower of your desire. That's exactly right. 
And that's, that's, that's exactly why I see food as a being and eating is a relationship. It's like, you know, most I, important thing we can do. It's the I, most important thing we do, even just the way it relates to the plant it comes from and how it carries its body through our bodies. It's highly intimate. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a reason why food and sex are always so like, you know, coupled it's, it's very interesting for me because my illness makes food really, really hard. And so I'm hyper aware of it and hyper aware of how it doesn't work in my body, how it does work in my body. And something I was thinking about is I could problematize how my body is so sensitive to food, but I could also think of it as being like this profound celebration of how, uh, like how food affects me, that my body is just like, it's like, oh yeah, wow, oh my God. Like, That's exactly right. You know, this idea of being sensitive, I've been transforming into just being sensational. Like you're, you really get to be alive to the sensations that you might miss otherwise. Exactly. And I have an extreme uh, violent response to gluten in my body. So I can't have <laughs> any gluten. So, you know, when, when I, I, again, if I could problem, if I would problematize this, it would be this like horrible affront to my, 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 um, uh, I guess human experience. It wouldn't be fair. Things would be so hard yet. If I play with that desire piece, it's like, well, what does my body desire? You know, can I find deep pleasure in turning away a dish that looks amazing because there's gluten in it? Is there something I don't know about my body that it wants a different landscape of food? And it just opens up this this gratitude when you do find this incredible <laughs> gluten-free meal in a restaurant, you know? I, I mean, it's also, I, I think a lot about how, I think about neural pruning and sensory gating, which is how we hear our name in a crowded room. Like mm -hmm. there's so much sensory stimuli, but we can dampen some to brighten others. And I think a lot about food restrictions or certain experiences that are too much for our nervous systems as being a kind of unconsensual neural pruning where something is dampened to brighten something else. So I think that the question I ask is when something is dampened, when I'm not allowed something, when something falls out of focus, be it sugar, be it gluten, be it dairy, be it the fact that I can't go hiking in certain dangerous places anymore because of an insect allergy, when something feels denied and dampened, what sensory experience is being brightened? And sometimes it's hard to immediately see. Like I think a lot about how, you know, people who are hearing impaired often develop heightened sensory mm -hmm. um, sense, like experiences. Like I was reading about how there are some people who have developed clicking, like basically they echolocate. They can go hiking and biking on their own. And so this one experience has been dampened. This other has been extraordinarily brightened. And so what I'm asking in my own life recently is like, I feel like sometimes like a, you know, I did not order being this weird kind of monk off the menu, but what, it, what is actually being brightened? That's right. And that goes back to our conversation around nature and survival and trauma as, as the kind of medicine and the formula for all this. We don't, have these incredible evolutionary experiences like without some kind of a rupture so oh, yeah. if that's muted to use these words then what else is born from that mutation yeah. if you will right yeah yeah mm. i know I, I i oftentimes think that we're just like trying to medicate and treat away our superpowers that are going to be yes. most useful as we confront societal collapse and climate change that, and that, you know. that's that's my one of my goals in this lifetime if, if i had one which i loosely have any but one of them is what you just said to teach people that these things that we have problematized and psychoanalyzed they are these incredible superpowers like yeah. how to invoke them and work with them and nurture them instead of trying to you know get rid of experiencing them and i think this idea that like there are people who are never traumatized and then there are people who are and there's some kind of weird hierarchy of that is fake we're only 100%. ever temporarily safe <laughs> you know That's there's right. going to be something that happens that charges your body at some point so it everything, would be yes. you can negotiate with that yeah I, I, I said everything but i meant to say absolutely but it's it's like everyone experiences yeah. that lightning strike i mean we're initiated at birth with it you can't it happens the moment you come into the world. It's an extremely traumatic event. It's like, you know, your body is ruptured it. by flesh rhizome to your mom. Like, you know, it begins <laughs> yes. with literal rupture. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I even think of just the suddenly having to breathe air. 
I mean, how sensationally damaging and terrifying that must feel in the body to go from being a water being to suddenly having like dry, cold air going into your lungs. <laughs> so strange. Um, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, obviously, but and um, we will. It's, it's and and we we have and we will. <laughs> uh, but I'm just so happy. I'm so happy to have you as a friend. I'm so happy to have you in the world because uh, I think what's so refreshing about you is I find it very hard genera generationally to find people in this generation of age that can think outside of this identity box through the lens of nature. And I think nature is so easy to get away from and to start having these social constructs of really human supremacy and human hierarchy rule how we see and define and live our lives. So the work you do really gives us this invitation to shed that in this really loving, poetic, like yummy way. that's like fun and exciting. So I, I thank you for that. Well, the feeling is mutual. I feel like we have mind jazz and it's, you know, but with body jazz, like mind, mind, body jazz, spirit jazz. And, <laughs> it, it, it feels, I, yeah, I think sometimes it feels our generation is dealing with a lot of physical illness and uncertainty and pain. And the way our trauma response for that has been to go deep into identity. So it's been so refreshing to talk with someone who does want to help people have a better time in their organisms, but isn't going to do it in a way that feels narrow. So I'm very, very glad that we are cross pollinating. I love that. I'm going to highlight helping people have a better time in their organisms. That's exactly <laughs> what we're here to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, my love. I really appreciate it. Ooh. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.